This episode is brought to you by our good friends at NFL Sunday Ticket on YouTube TV. I'm sure by now you've all gotten back into your Sunday routines, but they could be even better. With NFL Sunday Ticket and YouTube TV, you get the most live NFL games all in one place, every game, every Sunday. And you can even watch up to four different games at once with Multiview, one of my favorite inventions of this decade. It's exactly what you need to catch all the action. Make your Sundays more magical. And also, YouTube TV is great. I got it this year. It's awesome. Sign up now at youtube.com slash BS. Device and content restrictions apply. Local and national games on YouTube TV. NFL Sunday ticket for out-of-market games excludes digital-only games. Hey, it's Ryan Seacrest. Life comes at you fast, which is why it's important to find some time to relax. A little you time. Enter Chumba Casino. With no download required, you can jump on anytime, anywhere for the chance to redeem some serious prizes. So treat yourself with Chumba Casino and play over a 100 online casino-style games, all for free. Go to ChumbaCasino.com to collect your free welcome bonus. Sponsored by Chumba Casino. No purchase necessary. VGW Group. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. Hello and welcome to this 1865 podcast special. As the new season is just around the corner, we thought we'd do something a little bit different. It's Stephen Topless here and I am joined by Tom Newton, the Maradona of the Midlands and Jeremy Davis for this episode. So let's get on with the show and it's over to Tom Newton, our Master of Ceremonies. Tom. Following on from our worst 11 draft, which we did a few months ago, we're going to do our best 11. So we're basically the same principle as before. Um, one is, once a player is gone, that's it. That player cannot be picked. And um, the rule is that we must have seen them live and must have made more than one appearance for uh, Nottingham Forest. So um, seeing um, me and Stephen were on the pod last time when we did our worst draft, we got... Uh, Maradona of the Midlands and Jeremy Davis with us this evening. So um, seeing them making their debuts on this uh, type of podcast, uh, Jeremy, you can go first to pick your goalkeeper for your best 11 draft. Okay, well, even I'm not old enough to have seen Peter Shilton play for Forrest, um, but I, I, I was lucky enough to see Mark Crossley uh, and discovered uh, today that uh, Doris De Vries uh, was actually in goal uh, when I when I saw uh, a League Cup tie against Tottenham. Um, so that added to my uh, my my list of resources. Um, but I did go and see um, the first game at Tottenham last season, uh, which was in the middle of a very bad run for the club. But in goal that day was a two times, I think, or possibly more. Champions League winning goalkeeper uh, by the name of Kayla Navas. I know he d- divides opinion on uh, on 1865, um, but I, I thought uh, as 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 a first choice uh, goalkeeper he would do me nicely. So I'm going for Kayla Navas as my my keeper. Fair enough. I, I don't think um, I, I don't think he, many of us would have picked him because obviously it's quite uh, recent um, when he actually played for us. But uh, yeah, um, with his um, prestige in the game and playing for Real Madrid it's not a uh, bad choice that isn't it? it's uh, quite a smart choice so Maradona of the Midlands your pick seeing you're the second debutant on this type of pod well I am going to go for Umar Crosley um, he was part of the probably the, mo- the most successful Forest team I ever saw uh, the, the, the Brian Clough of transitioning to the Frank Clark team and he wasn't just a great shot stopper his Distribution was awesome too. He could ping a ball out onto the left wing 99 times out of 100. It would land on Steve Stone's toe without any danger at all. And he just set up all of our counter attacks as well. He got, grabbed the ball and bowled it out. It's been a, a real source of frustration for me these last few years watching our S Housery and our time wasting. 
It means all you want to see is your goalkeeper grab it, run to the edge of the box and get your fast players going. But they don't do that anymore. It's, that's far, they're far too cerebral and clever to do that now. The, the, the fast attack just doesn't work, does it? But yeah, Mark Crosley, brilliant shot stopper. Bit of a shaky start for it, I have to admit. I've, the uh, the FA Cup uh, tie down at Portsmouth when we lost, it, it wasn't his finest hour. And uh, him being sick on the side of the pitch there. I actually saw him be sick behind the goal at a home game in the league as well, around about that sort of time. So maybe maybe his preparation wasn't what you'd call professional in those days. But still, to overcome that and still be a brilliant goalkeeper, an international goalkeeper for Wales, and save an FA Cup final penalty, I think I've won this hands down. Fair enough. Yeah, um, Mark Cross, I think he played about 300 games for us, didn't he? And uh, he was uh, our number one for over 10 seasons. So, yeah. Great choice there at Maradona with Midlands. Uh, Steve, your pick for your goalkeeper. I'm going to go with somebody. I should say, actually, I started watching Forest in 1996, as in going to watch them live. So um, it probably cuts out the likes of Steve Sutton, Van Broeckelen and the likes who came before. But I'm going to go with a man who played a big part in getting Forest into the Premier League and where they are currently. And that's Bree Samba. He was superb in the promotion season under Steve Cooper. The way he dominated that penalty shootout against Sheffield United, having also made some big saves in the game up to that point. There was that one late in the second half where he somehow gets his toe on the ball and stops a shot from, I think it's Ndai, which would have probably sent Sheffield United to Wembley. He was a great character for us, great shot stopper, could distribute the ball well. He was good at the s housery that Maradona was mentioning. And I think if he was still at the club, he'd be our number one in the Premier League and he would have more than made that step up. So, Brie Samba for me, of course now, he's a French international as well. Yeah, strong choice there. And um, yeah, for that season, um, when we went up, he was absolutely brilliant. And like you said, that save in the playoff semi-final and then the, set, uh, the penalties with it. He was, uh, he was brilliant. And uh, if it wasn't for that save, we probably wouldn't be sat here waiting for Forrest to start their third consecutive season in the Premier League. So my choice, um, well, my two choices had gone in terms of Mark Crosley and Bree Samba. And um, our goalkeepers, in, apart from Samba, have been a bit patchy, haven't they, in recent years. But um, he wasn't here long. Um, but what he did do is... Um, it was a safe pair of hands between the sticks in the uh, 97-98 promotion season. And um, I'm going to go for Dave Besant, for somebody who I saw um, live um, at 38. He was still a really good goalkeeper. And even when we got into the um, the Premier League for the 98-99 season, even though all the players around him weren't good enough, uh, Dave Besant was still one of our best players in that Premier League um, season. Uh, so I'm going to go for Dave Besant as my choice. Yeah, he was good when uh, when Bassett brought him in. So much so that when we got promoted, he had he had the number one shirt, and Crossley was number thirteen and on the bench, which yeah. uh, which just shows you how good he was. Still playing at Forest at forty two, wasn't he? Besant was that forty two when he left forty one or forty two when he eventually left. Yeah, I mean. Um... David Platt had a, a falling out with Crosley and Crosley uh, ended his, uh, what is it, 13 year stay at Forest and and everything. So, um, yeah, Besant was a decent uh, pair of hands um, behind um, the back four at the time. So, um, so that's my choice. And so moving on to um, our fullbacks, um, seeing I had the last choice, I get the first choice now. So I'm going to go for a, a left back and you probably all know what who it is. He absolutely epitomised um, team spirit, leadership, uh, had a wonderful left foot, penalties, free kicks, you name it. And he was our stalwart at left back for um, nearly 20 years. And that is uh, Stuart Pearce. And obviously um, he came back as a manager and all of that, which didn't go according to plan. But for that, what, 15, nearly 20 years, he was absolutely brilliant um, for Forrest. So, yeah, Stuart Pearce is going to be my uh, pick as left back. Yeah. Can't argue and with I, that. I, well, mm. An iconic choice. He just epitomised everything. You, as, a, as a youngster, you wanted to be him. You idolised him and you sort of 
pretended to be him when you're know, taking free kicks in the back garden, smashing it, <laughs> smashing it at home, and uh, and I still cried do. when he was made England captain. <laughs> Yeah, he just had that tattooed, didn't he? Like a hallmark of a nutter. And um, if the stories are correct, that he didn't really warm up, did he? He used to like kick a battered football in the corridors, listening to the Sex Pistols, and and that epitomised the cult hero and so on. Never came out before a match. First time you saw him when he came running out, and there was like this psycho, 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 and he was absolutely pumped up. The whole crowd was going, and yeah, she's just, and it was just so nice that he could come back. And first as a player for Man City, I remember we were all doing it. I think that was the first time he came back on. It was a, maybe a Sunday night game we were having yeah. at that point or something. Our TV digital and all of that. Yeah. So, and then, uh, then finally, when he came back as a manager, that first game against Blackpool, that welcome he got, that was just uh, livery forever. Yeah, definitely. So, but also, uh, also kind of the prototype of a modern left back in that he wasn't a wing back. He was obviously, you know, principally very much known for his tackling and his defending, but. I remember I went to a match at Wembley in 91, uh, England against Turkey, and he, you know, he dropped his shoulder and went past the fullback and crossed it in for Alan Smith, of all people, to, to head in. Um, but, yeah, compared with, you know, they talk about fullbacks being attacking forces in the modern game in the way that they never were. In, but, yeah, I mean, yeah, quite apart from the goal scored column uh, and the number of goals he scored from open play, you know, the number of times he would go down the wing and cross the ball yeah absolutely yeah would, would probably would would thrive in in the, in the modern game i think uh even if he'd have to turn down the tackling a little bit <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh, uh steven your pick for your fullback position um i'm gonna go with the player that replaced stuart pierce when he left in 1997 and that's alan rogers who came in and was a really good player in the first of all in the team that got promoted under Dave Bassett in '98, and then performed well in the Premier League. One of our few shining lights in that season '98-'99. Carried on playing for Forest for a few years. He was really good under David Platt. Chipped in with plenty of goals. Platt gave him that real license to go forward. He was a good technician, Rogers or Tank, as I've perhaps should call him. Um, and to come in and replace Stuart Pearce would have, was no mean feat, but he came in and did the job brilliantly and was, was a really good player for us for four or five years. So yeah, my left back is Alan Rogers. Good choice. Um, Maradona of Midland, your pick. Oh, it's a tricky one. I'm going to go for 50-50 on this one. I'll go Nicky Shorey, just, just for that brief spell, he was at Forest and he gave us all that hope and he just showed his quality. And then just, if only we could have signed him that season, if only. But yeah, he was, he was a great player, just added that balance when left back was a real problem for us. And it's uh, just a pity we couldn't see more in a red shirt. Fair point. Um, Jeremy, your pick for fullback. Well, my 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 left back options are getting getting pretty limited now, uh, given my relative uh, paucity of of of, of uh, as as a match going fan. But um, I've narrowed it down to uh, oh. Perch or Ren and Loddy. So I'm going to go with Ren and Loddy because uh, I thought he was a source of genuine regret that he didn't hang around for this season. Um, just gone because I thought he was. You know, looked for a, a, a pretty good option in that in that first season back in the Premier League. So, uh, yeah, counterintuitively, um, contrary to all expectations, I've got two extremely modern players uh, in in my in, in in my draft. So, um, so yeah, run and Lottie for me. Fair enough. Um, so, Stephen, um, your next pick for fullback. My next pick for fullback is a couple of names here that I could pick um I more more uh more recent picks as well all of these but I think I'm going to go with just because he was so good in the promotion season Jed Spence I know he played as a right wing back technically but he did 
he did play right back on a couple of occasions in that campaign and he was just fantastic. His link up down the right hand side with Brennan Johnson was electric and he was chipping in with goals. He was a constant threat and it's a it's a real regret that we didn't manage to keep hold of him. I know his head was turned by Spurs and you can argue who would turn down Spurs in that situation. But if he'd stayed at Forest under Cooper and come up into the Premier League, I would have loved to have seen if he could have adapted and, and kicked on from where he was because that season in the Championship was outstanding. One of the best individual seasons I think I've seen from a Forest player. So on that basis alone, despite the fact he was a lone player as well for that season, Jed Spence is my right back. Good choice. And um, yeah, in the opinion of him, what could have been if his um, head wasn't turned? So um, so yeah, I completely understand why you've gone for Jed Spence, but um, seeing he's left for the forest, his career hasn't gone probably down the path that he wanted it to. So um, I think it's my picks next. Um, so for my right back, um, similar time when Stuart Pearce was here, really, um, he was signing from Swansea City in a good three or four season. He was brilliant for us and marked um, Zola out the game, if you remember, um, back in the day. And he just bombed up and down and just balanced the whole back four. So I'm going to go with Des Little as my uh, right back. He had, a, he had a perfect partnership with Steve Stone. They they both attacked together and they both defended together and uh, really, really an integral and unbeatable part of that that promotion team and that, that first season back in the Premier League. Good choice, Tom. Thank it's you. very interesting that you uh, you mentioned Gianfranco Zola, who wasn't the tallest, because the, the main thing that I remember, my outstanding thing that comes to mind when I think of Des Little is that I, I have a, a 95-96 Fantasy Football League yearbook uh with with the summaries of each players uh and des little says des is like an airbus 320 suspect in the air and uh so yeah <laughs> so clearly zola wasn't going to trouble him too much in that regard but anyway yeah uh like 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 like, uh, like you say great choice so um jeremy you're next i'm gonna go um uh, i'm torn um between uh, the, the 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 two men who played right back in the ninety one cup final, uh, the man who started and the man who came on. But I'm going to go with the man that was on the other end of that uh, incident that basically uh, mucked up Paul Gascoigne's career. It was Gary Charles. It was no fault of his own. Um, got the winner in well, not not the winner. Got a goal in the semi final against West Ham. Got the fourth goal. Um, um. Perhaps the less famous of the Charles brothers, um, with the, with 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 his his name is DJ comedian actor brother Craig, uh, and of course went to Derby, uh, which uh, a, a, a um, an, an unforgivable crime. But still, uh, for a while it looked like I mean I think there was one England toured Australia in ninety one, and at one point there was a summer that was three quarters forest because it was Charles Walker Pierce, and I think. Oh, some other non-entity, uh, or some non-entity, and sent back from play for another club. But anyway, yeah, I'll take Gary Charles. Good choice. Um, Madonna of the Midlands, uh, your pick. Hmm, now this one again, a, a bit torn. I was very close to picking Mathieu Lujon for the position. He just he was uh, a great player, sort of silky left fullback, got got up and down the uh, flanks well, defended well. Um, and he had a, a, a long career at Forest, but I'm gonna go for Matty Cash. Um, he's proven to be a, a tremendous player in the Premier League. He's, he's, he's fulfilled all the potential he showed at Forest, and he was just such an awesome athlete. Gave everything and learned the position. He started off as a winger, so he had to learn the position. Uh, but as soon as he, he moved back to the right back position, he was uh, like a duck to water. Um, and um, that goal against West Brom, who can never forget it, cutting inside for edge of the box, Matty Cash goal. <laughs> <laughs> I just got it off. He's really pretty as well, isn't he, Matty Cash? He's a he's a good looking lad, and so I think that's something to do with the water in Nottingham. Because if no, if nobody's seen the uh, 1865 panel, we're all we're all pretty pretty good looking fellas, aren't we, lads? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can still see the um, the 
the war damage on us after watching Forest for these years. So <laughs> we're all really, uh, we're all really twenty years old, aren't we? If any of the listeners haven't seen it, I do implore you to look up "Keeping Fit with Kashi" on YouTube, which was the lockdown video that he made of him doing uh, mountain climbers in front of the most 1980s looking sofa you've ever seen. I mean, it looked like he nicked it from a TVAM studio. It was, I mean, I presume now that he's like gone up in the world, he's probably hopefully been able to afford yeah, a decent, uh, some decent new furniture. But yeah, um, I, 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 I recommended viewing the Keeping Fit with Cashy video. Oh, uh, well. Uh, Maradona of the Midlands, it's your pick, seeing you went well, last in the last round. Well, it's, I guess it's the most obvious choice that anybody's going to have. It's got to be Desmond Sinclair Walker, the best defender in the world when he was at Forest. And let's face it, you'll never beat Des Walker. He was just so silky smooth, fast. Never, no, nobody could beat him. Just put Nick to toe in to get the wall off a of striker. And uh, it's just such a pity that his, his career will be remembered for scoring two own goals, which cost us so dearly. But he, I don't think the love ever diminished for him. I was, I was there in 91 at the uh, Old Market Square when the, when the club came back and the t- team were on, on the uh, balcony of the council house. And every single person in Old Market Square sung his name and he was choked up. There was in tears at the, uh, with emotion. And uh, I think he, he realised that um, nobody blamed him and he was still held in the highest of his team so Des Walker for me first centre back yeah great choice um, at the time wasn't it he was an absolute Rolls Royce of a um, defender and even like players like Ian Wright still hold him in uh, great esteem uh, for the type of uh, defender he was and uh, at the time um, you mean you had like your Terry Butchers and everything but yeah Des uh, yeah bit of class um, when uh, he uh, played for either England or Forest. So, uh, but uh, Jeremy, uh, it's your go for your, one of your centre-halves. This is a really tricky one. I've got a choice between the old and the relatively new. And I say relatively just because of the age of the player concerned. But I'm actually going to, again, run counter to expectation. And I'm going to take Felipe because... Just that run of games at the end of last season, yeah, not the season before last, when we stayed up, he was quite obviously a rock. I only saw him uh, live uh, in the game at White Hart Lane when, uh, well, or Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, uh, to give it its, its proper title, uh, which wasn't a great day for for Forrest or or, or or anyone associated with the club. But um, the Southampton match when he had that goal disallowed. Uh, I just, you know, I was listening on the radio. I remember how gutted we all were when that one was was ruled out for uh, nefarious reasons. But I mean, obviously, um, you know, that particular season, he was he was immaculate. Good choice. Um, my ch- uh, choice now. Um, he's still here, and I'm thankful that it looks like he's going to go into this season as a Forest player. Um, I've never seen a player come from the other side of the world and just look like he's played in the Premier League for like years. And it, I mean, obviously he's not the best in the air, but one-on-one is brilliant. Um, with the ball at his feet, he's brilliant. And I'm going to go f- uh, for Murillo because he's absolutely, he, he's going to go right to the top. I'm generally convinced of that. And it'd be nice for him to go to the top with Forrest, but obviously you've got to know where you are in the food chain kind of thing. And I'd love him in like, what, three or four years to potentially play for like someone like Real Madrid and lift the um, Champions League. And and I'm going to go for Murillo. I think he's that good. So, and I enjoyed watching him last season and he just got better and better by each game. Cannot argue with that. Uh, Steve, your pick for centre-half. One of your centre-halves. <clears throat> So my first centre-half is Michael Dawson. I absolutely loved him when he came through at Forest. I thought he was brilliant. And in the playoff season under Paul Hart, as a 18-year-old, 19-year-old, he was fantastic. Alongside Des Walker, who'd come back to the club by that point and was the the sort of guiding influence for, for a young Dawson. He was brilliant at campaign. And 
I was there the day we played Burnley at home. We won five nil and Dawson drilled one in from about 25 yards low into the far corner. He had a good ping on him as well. Like pass a ball out, find really good direct passes to the wings and good diagonals. And I know we had him on the payroll recently, but I will never forgive Mark Clattenburg for sending him off against Sheffield United in the playoffs because back then that was not a red card offence. And I think had Dawson been in the team in the team for the second leg, we might not have lost it, particularly in the way that we did. Next choice, uh, Jeremy. I'm actually going to take another player that, uh, that that left us for Derby, which is again almost unforgivable, but. I happen to remember that in the 1992 League Cup final, they had a, a sprint competition on the pitch because um, we were all lacking um, any other... We were that desperate for entertainment in those days. They had something called the Rumbelow Sprint Challenge, uh, whereby the fastest player from every club had to try running 100 metres. And our entry, uh, and he did say at the time, it's probably because Des Walker couldn't be bothered, but our entry was a young defender by the name of Darren Wassell. And so just from a pace perspective, because my other centre-backs, Felipe, is possibly lacking a little bit in the speed stakes, I'm actually going to take Darren Wassell, who I saw, uh, just to put my credentials on the table, play for the club in an FA Cup tie at home to Hereford United in 1992, uh, which we won 2-0. Stuart Pearce scored with a diving header. Teddy Sheringham also got a goal. And I'm pretty sure managed to put a ball over the roof of the stadium uh, from inside the penalty box. So, yeah, but I'll take Darren Russell. Surprising choice, but um, I never saw him play, so I'll have to take your <laughs> word on it. So, um, so yeah. Um, Maradona of the Midlands, your pick. I can't believe I've got so lucky to go my two first choice centre-halves. I'm going to go for Colin Cooper. Um, he was an integral part of that promotion season under Frank Clark. And uh, he was not only just a great defender, he could tackle, he could uh, head the ball, but he scored, scored a dozen goals that season as well, if I remember. He was uh, handy on a free kick and uh, deadly in the box as well uh, uh, from uh, corners and what have you. So, uh, super Colin Cooper. Uh, and we missed him when he left. We, we, uh, we tanked a bit. Um, but yeah, it's got to be Colin Cooper. Fair play. Um, yeah, but he was brilliant, wasn't he? From what ninety three to ninety eight when he when he left. So Stephen, your pick. That's one of my picks gone. Colin Cooper. I had him down here. Um, yeah, there's a few names here, and very difficult to choose. I've got two names in mind. They played alongside one another about 10, 15 years ago. And I think I am going to go with Kelvin Wilson, specifically Kelvin Wilson in his first spell at Forest, because he was excellent alongside Wes Morgan in that Billy Davis playoff, in those two Billy Davis playoff teams um, before he went off to Celtic. And I think had we got promoted, he'd have been perfectly fine in the Premier League, Nottingham lad, classy player, Kelvin Wilson. Good choice. So, um, my pick. A um, couple of my choices have gone like the uh, likes of uh, Dawson and Walker, so I'm um, a bit limited now. I'm going to go for Steve Chatter. I think he played 500 games or something from 86 till 99, 2000, was it, when David Platt um, booted him out the door with the likes of Crosley and etc. But um, yeah, to play the majority of those games at the top level of English football, i.e. first division then when it moved into the Premier League. I mean, he, he wasn't the greatest defender in terms of, but he just, he did a job. He headed it, he kicked it and uh, tackled and, um, and obviously he was captain at the time. And that 94-95 uh, partnership with Colin Cooper, um, I thought he was brilliant. And got the goal in Munich, of course. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And I, I stood behind him at Wembley to get into the player final in the queue. He still looks like he could play. He doesn't look like he's aged today. He's uh, he's <laughs> he's brilliant. And I I put, if, if you're listening, Steve, I must apologise. I took a sneaky photo of you without asking your permission. <laughs> I, 
when I, when I look when I got home and looked at it, he didn't look best pleased. This thing, Steve, I'm so sorry. Yeah, he's a nice uh, bloke as well. I interviewed him um, when I was at uni studying journalism and uh, did an interview with him. Really nice chap as well. So I'm sure he wouldn't have minded you getting the the, uh, the snap in there, Maradona. Give me daggers. He was giving me daggers. He was. Oh. The 1865 Match Report. You're listening to 1865, the Nottingham Forest Podcast. It's my turn for my, starting on my midfield now. 93 we signed him and signed him from Young Boys of Bern, I think it was, in Switzerland. And he played for Norway in the 94 uh, World Cup. And if you remember when we got, uh, went down under Cluffy, we were struggling in the, um, the first division then. And uh, Frank Clark brought him in and... Um, he was brilliant that season and he was brilliant the season after when we got promoted um, in the midfield and he scored um, some world-class goals. I remember the um, the goal against Sheffield Wednesday where he's volleyed it into top corner um, and then he left in acrimonious circumstances, if you remember. I think he went to Blackburn for peanuts. But for that two seasons, I thought he was a really classy midfielder and I'm going to go for uh, Lars Bohinen. Yep, he was ab- absolutely brilliant. Um, absolutely hero worshipped, loved at Forest Lake. Very few players ever have been. Um, the Bohemian song was probably the most sung song at the time. And he scored from a corner as well, famously. And the day he left, it broke my heart. And to make it even worse, he said, joining Blackburn is like winning the lottery. And he didn't mean metaphorically. He just meant financially. He's like, yeah, I'm set up for life here. Brilliant. Happy days. Steve, your pick for your midfield. I'm going to go central midfield as well. And my first choice is Morgan Gibbs-White. He's probably my favourite Forest player of the moment. I love watching him. He's a brilliant technician. And so much of our good play goes through him. Technically, really good. Good movement. He works hard off the ball. And even just little things like his little flicks and some of the passes he plays... Sometimes I wonder how he's seen the ball actually on in the first place. You think of the flick for the goal that Danilo scored against Southampton, where he just knocks it off the heel of his boots into Danilo's path for a goal. He scored some great goals, assisted plenty as well. And I'm sure one day he'll go on and end up playing for England. And I hope that he remains a Forest player for a very, very long time. Morgan Gibbs-White. Great choice. Uh, I think if Yates isn't on the pitch, I'd, I wouldn't hesitate giving him the captaincy. And I think he just like drags the team. And like in games last season, I thought he was like head and shoulders um, the best player on the park. So yeah, great choice. Maradona in the Midlands, your pick for midfield. Okay, so we seem to be going for the uh, more attacking player there. So I'm going to go for your friend of mine, Scott Gemmell. He's a much maligned figure. At Forest, and a lot of people really criticised him. I think that was mostly due to the fact that his he was Archie Gemmell's son, and he was he was seen to be a bit of a daddy's boy, a bit like Nigel was. But his performances, his stats, um, and uh, his career, even after he left Forest at Everton and for Scotland, I think proved that he was actually a great player. He scored tons of goals, a tremendous technique. He could pass it for fun. He could pass it as well as Nigel Clough. Uh, that brilliant side foot pass that he could do, so slit aside in the striker, um, the round the corner passes. They were both experts at that, and I, I practiced many of my teenage years just doing those round the corner passes, playing them blind. Um, and uh, the fact that he was a, a, quite a slight figure, well, it always always appealed to me. So I always felt sorry for them, and I always sort of identified with the slight figures: Nigel Clough, Gary Crosby, Scott Gemmell, uh, because they used to get picked on not only by the opposition team but our own fans. Uh, Scott Gemmell had brilliant hair lovely curly head of hair and scored some great goals and he was an integral part of our, our one of our most successful teams so I'm going to go with Scott Gemmell Yeah great choice and he scored um, two good goals in the ZDS final didn't he against uh, Southampton in 92 and uh, I watched those goals the other week and really well taken uh, goals um, I think one of them um, on commentary that says it was a deflection but it uh, it wasn't it was a really classy finish and yeah, the one that the one that really sticks in my mind, my mind was before the Premier League started. We were playing Villa at home. I think it was probably the last game of the season or towards the end of the season. It was a hot sunny day, 
and he just curled the ball in beautifully, beautifully from the edge of the 18-yard box into the top corner. He just passed it into the net. And that was that was Scott all over. He did he didn't blast them, he just passed them into the net. And all that, that's always a mark of a brilliant player. And he's at fortune his career as a uh, well-established coach by all accounts. So uh, Jeremy, your uh, your pick. My first choice for centre mid is one of the most iconic players uh, in Premier League history. And um, given that I've not got Psycho, would probably be my captain. I'm going to go for Roy Keane. Great choice. Yeah. He, he was brilliant. And especially the uh, what 92 93 season, uh, mm. he was head and shoulders above the players whenever he, where the empire at the time was um, collapsing, kind of thing. So, yeah, great choice. So, one. Um, um, you've got next pick. All right. Uh, so we're still in centre mid. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I am going to go, uh, well, similar vintage uh, and a player who, when they talk about the players that left at the back end of the cloth years and Walker and um, how hard it was to replace uh, sharing, obviously, when he left, nobody ever mentions Gary Parker. And I remember that first season when Villa, uh, you know, pushed Man United all the way for the league. He scored some brilliant goals. And in the FA Cup run in 91, uh, again, he yeah, he he just seemed to be a player capable of producing a little bit of magic, a little bit of artistry. Um, I, I, I saw him in the Cup final in 91, which obviously wasn't a brilliant day for the team. I've not studied him in depth um, to know exactly what kind of player he was but I think uh you know given that the Roy Keane that played for Forest was full of running and was the absolute epitome of the box to box midfielder um yeah I, I I will drop Gary Parker in there alongside him to to decorate the game with with his little bits of artistry and um and I very happily put my uh put my faith in those two yeah great choice so, um, yeah, and he scored some really nice goals. Like you said, um, the goal against uh, Bristol in the Littles Cup in 89, and then obviously the goal against Everton in the Simod Cup where he ran the length of the field. So, um, yeah. yeah, great choice. So, um, Maradona of the Midlands, your pick for your midfield? Well, to counteract the uh, attacking instincts of Scott Gemmell, I'm going to go for a nice defensive midfielder because you always need one of those. And I'm going to go for um, somebody we've interviewed on the pod here, actually, uh, Dave Phillips. Um, he, as, as as you mentioned, Lars Verheelen came in during that promotion season. Again, Dave Phillips did as well. It was he, he didn't come. He wasn't there at the start of the season. Came in a few games in, and uh, he made a, a big difference. He uh, just sat there in front of the defence and mopped everything up, and uh, was an integral part of that five man midfield uh, that got was promoted. So uh, yeah, I'm going to go for. Uh, the nicest man in football, Dave Phillips. And friend of the pod as well. So, yeah. um, Steve, your pick for um, you of a midfield. On a similar vein, I think I need a bit of steel in central midfield to uh, complement Morgan Gibbs-White. And I'm going to go for a club legend, Chris Cohen. Yeah. You, you just have to get Chris Cohen in the team somehow. He's a leader, he's a top bloke and was a great player and were it not for injuries, could have gone much higher in the game. Um, he was, and he played, I know he played in all sorts of positions for Forrest. He was filled in at left back. He played right midfield under Billy Davis. I'm sure he played down the left, but in central midfield, I think he'd be really effective, good passer, nice Technician on the ball, plenty of work and industry, and yeah, an all round good guy, Chris Cohen. And actually, I was at Villa Park the season before last watching Forrest lose. <clears throat> Thanks, John Joe Shelby. Um, and as I was walking out, so too was Chris Cohen just behind me. And he's a tall man, he's an elegant man. And yeah, I, I won't lie, I was uh, fangirling him a little bit there as we were walking out of Villa Park. And even with like uh, two neck and knees, he probably would have put a better performance in than uh, John Joe Shelby or Voldemort, as, um, as his name with some fans. So, <laughs> so um, right, my pick. Uh, I'm going to go down the same uh, road as a bit of steel in there, and uh, a player who 
I had admired for a long, long time when he was playing for um, Preston. And it would have been nice probably getting five years um, before we did. Um, real captain um, material leadership. And um, I'm going to go Paul McKenna. And I think if he wasn't as loyal t- as he was to Preston, I think he would have um, possibly followed uh, David Moyes to Everton um, at the time, at the turn of the millennium. Um, I think he was that good for Preston. And um, and I always said to myself, it'd be nice to have that kind of player for us, uh, show that bit of leadership and um, you la- somebody you love in the trenches. And then um, we had it. Uh, we got him, what, 2009? And he was still a good player, but it would have been nice getting five years before. So I'm going to go with um, Paul McKenna. Yeah, really good in that Billy Davis team he was. Just knitting yeah. everything together in midfield. Yeah. He almost seemed to hypnotise the opposition, didn't he? He was so good. <laughs> <laughs> very good. That's very good. Yeah. Yeah. So um seeing I went last that round, I get to pick first this round. I'm gonna go with one of my wingers um now. And I am going to go with a player who was signed from non-league Runcorn in the back end of the um, 90s. Um, I wouldn't say he was probably uh, the most committed player in terms of um, work rate, but give him the ball and he had a wonderful left foot and scored some really, really nice goals. And uh, I'm going to go with um, Ian Wayne. I think uh, for 10 years, he is very good, very good in what he did. Yeah, brilliant left foot. You said... Just a, an eye for the spectacular. I think had he got a bit more pace about him, he'd have played for England because we were crying out for left-sided quality. And I think just that lack of pace probably stopped him from getting international honours. Yeah, I'm surprised because of obviously Stuart Pearce was captain type. I'm surprised because if you remember just before year 96, uh, Toe Venables had all those friendlies for over a two-year period, didn't he? And he, I think he capped about over like 20 or 30 players in that period. And it would have been nice for him to get a cap and see what he could actually do on that left-hand side. But obviously he wasn't picked and uh, and that was that. Yeah, I think there was a perception that as a winger, he wasn't someone that would, you know, get a lot of crosses in. And you had Shearer, uh, Ferdinand and Sheringham. I guess I'm I'm speculating. I have, I have, I have heard that said, that he wasn't someone that would beat a full-back and with the ball in very much. And even anyway. one of the most and even one of the most gifted players around at the time in Matt Letissier didn't really get a um a go at um, playing for England, did he? I mean he only had a few matches, didn't he? Letissier, so um it, it is what it is. So uh Steve, your pick. Um this is a tough one because left midfield I've got a couple of options here. Um and with you taking Ian Wone, it's actually opened up a few um, I think I'm going to go for this player based purely on the level that he's done it at because I think the other players on my list have got plenty of talent and they might come up later on when the rest of you pick your pick your players for this position. But I'm going to go for Callum Hudson-Odoi as my left midfielder because much like Gibbs White, I love watching him. I think he's a really elegant and classy player when he's on song. I remember one of the first games we signed him, Grant said he was a bit rusty and, and playing his way into form, but the way he glided past defenders across the pitch, I've not, I've not seen that from a Forest player for a, I don't know how long. And last season he was chipping in with plenty of goals, a couple of assists as well, and I'm hoping that he can kick on this season and get even better because... The, you can see why he played for a, for a club like Chelsea and how he got England recognition. So yeah, Hudson Odoi gets the pick on the left hand side of my midfield. Great choice. So now down the middle and your pick. Well, I'm I'm very pleased to announce my pick for the left side of midfield is uh, Super Andy Reid. Um, I can't believe I'm so lucky to pick him. Uh, he's uh, he's such a talented player. Uh, run with the ball, score sh- score goals from distance, um, pass it. Um, really committed as well, and we called him the uh, Irish Figo back in the day. Uh, mm. So yeah, I'm, I'm delighted to announce it is Andy Reid. He was my other. He was my choice. It was between him and Hudson Odoi, and I just went with Hudson Odoi on the basis of 
him doing it in the well, Premier League for Forest, so probably a bit of recency bias there. But also Andy Reid, when he came back, was excellent again for Forrest. I, I'll always claim that in that season under Stuart Pearce before he got injured, he was the best player in the Championship. Yeah. yeah. And if you remember, he scored a lovely, lovely goal against Bolton. It was early in the season. I think it was 2-2. They've just been relegated and um, McGugan scored in that game where he's pinged it from 35 yards and gone into top corner. But Andy Reid, I think it come on to him and he just like, he's opened up his body and he's just clipped it into top corner. And I think it was like posting in. It was a really, really top finish. And um, yeah, I mean, if he wasn't for injuries, you never know what might have happened in that season because Cohen went down with injured and then obviously we lost the way and Pierce lost his job, but um, yeah, Andy Reid um, was a talented player, wasn't he? So, uh, um, Jeremy, your pick. Okay, well, I'm going to go with Chris Cummins because he, um, I saw him play uh, against uh, uh, Reading, I think. Um, and he was somebody that didn't hit the heights, possibly not that dissimilar to Ian Rowan in some senses. Didn't hit the heights, possibly that it, you know, it, it is his talent deserved. Um, but obviously, went to Scotland, uh, did really well, and had the potential. Had he been, you know, it's kind of like I once heard a set of Jermaine Genus, right player, wrong time, and you know, we've we've got a we've got a tradition of languid can't look like they can't really be bothered left wingers uh at, at, at forest go back to john robertson so yeah i think i'm i'm gonna it's, it's between him and kingsley black but i think i'm gonna take um take chris commons i got choice so um so you get first choice for the next round jeremy okay so from my right midfield uh well i'm delighted with this uh, and i am going to take uh, Steve Stone, because um, I was lucky enough to be present at the match at White Hart Lane, as it was then in 1994, um, when Forrest had just come up uh, and Bohemian scored an amazing goal that particular day. But the opening goal was scored um, counterintuitively enough from a Stan Collymore cross by Steve Stone, who then went on to set up a couple of goals for Brian Roy. and. I remember reading when he got injured in 98, 99, right at the start of the season. I remember reading in The Guardian or some newspaper, Furrow's game revolves around Stone, so they're really going to struggle now. And I thought, well, it's a bit much. You've know, got Pierce and Roy and a number of others. Um, but it, you know, it, it, so it came to pass. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take Steve Stone. And, um, yeah, him and Keane between them can, can, can do the running in midfield. Yeah, great choice. And uh, for that like mid nineties period, I mean, he got into the squad for Euro ninety six, but Steve Stone was a um, brilliant player. Um, and he even when he had his um, knee injury um, in ninety six, and he come back and was part of the team what got promoted. And um, yeah, he, he's a really good player and a player what um, really cared at the time, didn't he? Um, with all that nonsense with uh, Van Hoyt Dunk and everything, and then obviously uh, Villa come calling and he went there. But yeah, for good number of years um steve stone was a class um, player so uh Maldon and midlands your pick i'm gonna go for gareth mccleary he was uh re- virtually cost nothing i think we signed even bronze grove uh non-league bronze grove at the time under colin Coldwood and he, he oh, took bromley, a couple of yeah. seasons to uh, oh bromley sorry bromley yeah <laughs> bronze grove bromley same thing um, and they took a couple of seasons for him to um, get into the team. But once he did, once I think a few of the star players had left and uh, the responsibility fell on his shoulders, he turned into a revelation. He was uh, sort of running brilliantly with the ball, beating players, scoring goals. I think, one, I think it was against Bolton one afternoon at the City Ground where he just uh, turned the whole game round on, its, on, on his own and scored a world of a goal. Um, and um, I'm surprised he didn't make more of his career after he left us. I, I was I was sure he was going to be a, a top Premier League player, so always surprised me they didn't. But yeah, I'm I'm happy to go with uh, Gareth McLeary. Uh, Steve, your pick. Um, I'm going to add to the very modern feel of my midfield, and I'm going to have Brennan Johnson as my right midfielder, and. 
he was he's been one of Forest's most important players in the modern era, playing a massive role in getting us getting us promoted from the championship. What was it? Nineteen goals, loads of assists, linked up so well with Jed Spence, and they're going to link up again in my team here. I'm very happy with that, and we went and sold him on to Spurs for a massive fee. And before doing that, he played a part in helping Forest stay in the Premier League. Some big goals that season. There was a goal at Everton. I think our first away goal back in the Premier League for 23 years. He scored a goal against Leeds at home, which was a great finish on the volley. Other goals and assists on top of that. He's a real handful with his pace and directness. And yeah, I think I think at times last season we did miss him. So I'm going to bring Brennan back into the fold Brennan Johnson is my right midfielder. Uh, great pick. Um, I'm going to go with a player who Stuart Pearce signed in. He only stayed one season and then a couple of games into the season after. Um, but for pace and everything else, um, Michael Antonio, when we signed him, I thought I didn't rate him that much at Sheffield Wednesday in terms of he was just pace and nothing else. But when he came to Forest, he seemed to get his whole game together. And he was absolutely um, electric. And then he's gone on to have a really good career in the Premier League at um, West Ham. It would have been nice to obviously keep him a bit longer. But when the Premier League comes calling and at the time under Fawaz and, and everything with it, we didn't seem to be going to the Premier League fast, if you remember how the club was at the time. Um, so I'm going to go with uh, Michael Antonio. Uh, I thought he was uh, brilliant for us in that season we had him. Yeah, he was a really exciting player to watch and the way he could carry the ball past defenders, bully them off the ball even. And he he scored quite a lot of goals for us as well. There was that one against Norwich, the winning goal late in a game uh, when Stuart Pearce was manager. And it was just exciting. He could just pick the ball up on the halfway line, charge forward, cause some havoc and make something happen. Yeah, and... Yeah, like you say, he's gone on to be a really good Premier League player at West Ham. Yeah, and I had um, after that Norwich game, um, I actually uh, met him uh, in the lounge because we had some complimentary uh, tickets. And uh, on top of that, he was a really nice bloke as well and um, had a lot of time for everybody. So, um, so yeah, that's another good uh, trait of him. So, but um, seeing I went last in the last round, I'll go first this round. Um, and one of my strikers, um, Signed uh, on schoolboy forms in 1984. And I didn't get to see the peak of his career, but I did get to see him when he come back on loan when Stuart Pearce was caretaker manager. And you could still tell that Nigel Clough had still had that class. Um, and then when you look, watch the tapes back, he he wasn't the quickest player, but he was absolutely brilliant with the ball at his feet. And he was playing on absolute quagmire pitches, if you remember, back in the late 80s, early 90s. And if you could put that player um, on the pitches, what they're like now, which look like uh, snooker tables, aren't they? Um, he'd be a 50, 60 million pound player. He, he was that good. And some of the goals, what he scored, I mean, that goal, uh, what he scored, free kick, I think it was like 35 yards out, right into the uh, top corner against West Ham at Upton Park. And he was really a classy player. And um, being presumptuous here, but I bet it was incredibly hard to not only play under your dad, but your dad being Brian Clough. And um, I think he's our second all-time leading goal scorer with about 131 goals. Um, and yeah, Nigel Clough, when you look back on the tapes, um, he's he's absolutely brilliant and um, and he's done an incredible job at uh, Mansfield uh, to get them promoted uh, into League One for the first time in 20-odd years. Yep. Part of that holy trinity, Clough, Walker, Pierce of the eight, late 80s, early 90s. And uh, yeah, all heroes each and every one of them. Yeah. So, uh, Steve, your pick for your strikers. Okay, so first striker I'm going to go for is somebody who is a controversial figure in Forrest's history, but nobody could doubt his ability on the field. Pierre Van Hooydonk. He was Mm. a goal machine in that promotion season, 34 goals, so many penalties and free kicks. Basically, his free kicks were penalties because you knew if Forrest won a free kick, he'd be stepping up and there's a good chance the ball would hit the back of the net. 
And yes, he really let himself down the following season by walking out on the club as he did. But he was he was a class act and on based on pure ability, he's one of the best players I've ever seen at Forest. Yeah, um yeah, for that one season he was brilliant. And like he says, um a free kick was as good as a penalty when he was like what twenty five yards, thirty yards out, and he used to always get the ball to dip just in front of the goalkeeper and and obviously, um, with that season, he got into the Holland squad. Then, obviously, what happened after? It all come tumbling down. And with, uh, obviously, God rest his soul, um, Kevin Campbell uh, being sold to Trabban Sport, it all yeah. fell apart. But, but yeah, for that one season, Van Hoendonk was a uh, different gravy, wasn't he? So, yeah. And what a partnership um, with Kevin Campbell. Yeah, brilliant, yeah, the definitely. two of them. Yeah. So, um, how done in the Midlands, your pick? I can't look again. I can't. I've lucked out here, but he's got to be Stan Collymore, hasn't it? 50 goals, 78 appearances. He's charged us up to the Premier League, kept got us up to third place. The only player in the in in the history of the world where if he got picked it up out on the edge of his own box, you know he was gonna score. The whole stadium he to stand up as one as he dribbled past one player, two players, three players, four players, and curled it in from the edge of the box. The only player who I saw who could run faster with the ball than without it could score goals from right foot, left foot, outside the box, inside the box, with his head. Um, it's just a pity he went a bit too lally. But uh, apart from that, he was he was brilliant. So Stan Collymore. Yeah. yeah, great choice. So, um, Jeremy, your pick for striker. Well, you can pick the both well, strikers because it's your pick. Uh, seeing you're going to last, you're first in the next round. So, yeah, you can pick your two strikers now. Oh, wow. All right. Well, in that case... Um... You got to miss out on on, on Stan. Um, and I, I was thinking for anyone that's too young to have seen him, I was thinking earlier, was it like having a cheat mode, like when you're playing a video game? But then I realised, well, probably because if we'd had a cheat mode, we'd have won the league. We didn't. But it was yeah. a bit, I realised it was more like, you know, when you play Mario Kart and you yeah. go over, you get a power up and suddenly you're the quickest thing in the game or you get a rocket boost or you get more powerful. That was basically what it was like. You get some just you know, two or three times a game, he'd, he'd step over, you know, some sort of well mushroom for what I'm not implying anything, but you know, he would he would suddenly get a power up and suddenly be, you know, three times more powerful than anything else on the pitch, and you'd end up getting a couple of goals. But okay, I, well, I'm going to take the other half of that uh, iconic partnership. Um, this guy, I mean, I, I saw this guy play three times and he scored five goals. So I don't think you can really argue with that. They were all against Tottenham. Um, but Brian Roy, who I um, I know is, is, is in some ways equally or, or a, a, another controversial Dutch striker uh, in, in the way that he left the club. But uh, in the time, certainly in that first season post-promotion, when he was in 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 tandem with Collibor, he was uh, he, he was outstanding. So I, w- I will take him. Uh, and for my second striker, well, this is interesting. Uh, take a player that always seemed to be a good partner, uh, and no matter who he played with, uh, would always benefit greatly from uh, from the partnership. Uh, Plays, he probably won what fifty caps for England. Uh, only played for Forest for a season, but uh, well, a, a season in a game, as it turned out, scored the first goal in the history of the Premier League, uh, and that uh, man is uh, the man Brian Clough referred to as Edward Sheringham. Mal down to the Midlands, your um, striker pick. Those, I was going to go for Teddy Sheringham and Brian Roy next on my list. So having there, Teddy Sheringham by the. Up there with Sean Wright Phillips leaving on for a free transfer, the worst transfer decision we've ever made, letting Teddy Sheringham go that season. But anyway, it still hurts. It still hurts. But uh, so if having gone for lost those, I'll go for Super Kevin Campbell. He was um, again another player who took his time to settle in at Forest, uh, but once he got going, he, he was just tremendous. He, he had everything he wanted in a striker. He was strong. He was powerful. He was quick. He could finish. He could set up, set up your uh, um, other striker, as, as Van Hoyden found out. And it was just so painful when he left. Actually, this, this might be up there, just behind Sheringham as the worst transfer decision. Um, 
it was so painful when he left for Turkey. It was such an own goal from us. It was just such poor ownership and management to let him go. Um, and he's got to go down as, as one of the worst decisions in history. And yeah, but he was a brilliant player, and uh, and we I think we're all missed. Yeah, um, what I've noticed in doing this draft for the last hours is a correlation of a many sliding doors moments. So if you go back to where Jeremy's pick of Gary Charles, what, um, what he did, um, with Gary Charles being on the receiving end of that Paul Gascoigne tackle. So if Roger Milford did his job and sent Gazza off, could, would have saved Gaz, Gazza's career. Potentially could have saved Brian Clough because it basically, obviously, he went into a tailspin for the two years after that. So he could have like retired on a high and and retired um, as a happy man um, instead of all the controversy. Then with Teddy showing him if he would have like stayed kind of thing, we might have stayed up that season and obviously might have established ourselves as a Premier League club. Then Kevin Campbell leaving. And like I said earlier, keeping that squad together, adding a couple of people to it, we might have actually... Uh, done something in the, in terms of being a, an established Premier League club. So there's a lot of sliding door moments when you look back on our uh, checkered history, um, if you know what I mean. We do. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so. Um, Steve, your pick, your last striker pick. My last striker pick is going to be Brit Asombolonga, because when he first came to Forest. He was so good. He was signed in for £5 million from Peterborough. He was a player who was very much on the up at that time. He came in and he was a goal machine under Stuart Pearce. That, that first half of that season, and until he got the injury against Fulham, wasn't it, I think, where he'd scored a couple of goals in the game, got injured, and we really missed him after that. Um, I think that was one of Dougie Friedman's first games. But I remember some great goals. There was a one against Derby where on the edge of the box, he collected the ball, swivelled, spun the defender and bent it in with his left foot. There was a goal at MK Dons on a great away day and many more in between as well. I thought he was going to break goal scoring records the way he was going, the way he started his Forest career. Um, and had he managed to stay fit, I think he would have been a massive player for us because he had the talent and he had the ability and could have easily gone on to play in the Premier League. So I'm going to have my front two, Pierre van Hooydonk and Britta Sombolonga. Loads of goals. Yeah, definitely. So um, I get the final pick, and it's a toss-up between two players, and it's very, very close. Um, and both strikers that um, I absolutely loved. But I think the player who I'm going to go for is um, a player who I don't think is very much undervalued within the fan base. And um, he, he did miss a lot, but he, then he scored a lot as well. And um, and he used to always come deep to get the ball and everything. And I thought for um, a number of seasons when we signed him, uh, I think it's from Bournemouth in uh, 2018, uh, Lewis Graben, I, I thought he brilliant. And the goal is what he did, did score. And then he had that link up with Carvalho and... Then the goals what he scored prior to getting injured in that um, promotion season a couple of years ago, um, I thought he was brilliant and um, scored some really really important um, goals for us. Um, so, and I was going to pick uh, Rob Earnshaw because I, I thought he, he at the time uh, he was very good and how he linked up with uh, Dexter Blackstock in that season under well two seasons under Billy Davis. I thought he was a really uh, good player, but um, obviously. His goals that didn't mean that would uh, would uh, get promoted, but Graben had a massive contribution leading up to my uh, promotion campaign. So I'm going to go Lewis Graben. Yeah, he was great. Probably one of the um, better signings of the Maranakis era, I would say, because he was just a consistent goal scorer. You could rely on him, and yeah, I I was always a fan of his. To be fair, and I, I thought he was a really good player and. I was glad that he was able to help the club get promoted before he moved on Um, because he, yeah, he did more than most in that sort of 2018 to 22 period. So yes, that's all of our teams and yeah, looking back over them, they all seem to be a really good mix of skill and quality and reliability and players who, who really did make a positive impact for Forest over the last what 30 years. 
given uh, not giving away our ages too much. We will put the teams out on social media in the next couple of days. So do have a look at our feeds and let us know, first of all, what you think of our teams and what your teams would be. And let's let's wrap things up there. So thanks to Tom Newton for chairing and, and running this best player draft. It's been lots of fun. Thanks to the Maradona of the Midlands and also to Jeremy Davis and thank you as well for joining us we will be back soon so do keep an eye on our feeds for that very soon thanks again and we'll see you next time Podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network.